really do appreciate your time. And before we get going, I do want to turn it over to Vice Mayor Connolly to, uh, to welcome you and say a few words. So the handheld mic is, Cindy's got it. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Beth Connolly, the Vice Mayor of Falls Church. Mayor Tarter is out of town for his niece's graduation today. So I just want to welcome you all to the room. Thank you for coming to this Sunday series. Is this the first time that any of you have come to a Sunday series meeting? Are we all veterans here? Okay, so there's lots of new stuff to learn today, and I'm excited about what Dr. Noonan and White Shields have to say. So, and then at the end, there'll be some opportunities too for some engagement from you. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Vice Mayor Connolly. All right. Do you want to say anything before we get going? Let's go. All right. Let's go. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. The idea of the Sunday series, of course, is to share with you sort of an update of where we are um, with our planning for the high school project and also for the 10-acre project. Um, the last couple of Sunday series we had were sort of intermingled with budget and the, the project updates and the project updates seem to sort of get short shrift on, uh, uh, with respect to the budget. So we are glad to be back and better than ever to share some information with you about um, what's happening at the high school and on the 10 acre site. Um, I'm super excited um, to announce that we have obviously gone through the RFP down select at this point. Um, and we have three finalists, and I'll just remind you all of who the finalists are. Um, they were Clark Construction and Mosley Architects. They were also Davis Smoot Construction with Perkins Eastman Architects. And lastly, we had Gilbane Construction with Stantec and Quinn Evans. And um, right now, we are in the final parts of the RFDP down select process, um, which on our timeline kind of brings us out here. Um, which, is, which is pretty significant. We've come a long way, I think, since the November 30th date um, when we started with the RF, uh, RFP for conceptual proposals. Um, and in January, uh, went forward with the down selection of that and put a new RFP on the street. And now on May 17th, the due date um, came and went. And all three of those finalists submitted um, their full project proposals. And we're very excited. Um, to start diving into those. They're currently um, being reviewed by Jim Wise, who is our procurement specialist here in the city of Falls Church for compliance. And once that's done, um, we will have a kickoff. So that speaks to a little bit of where we are in our timeline. So we have the RFDP kickoff uh, for our team on May 22nd. Um, and that team is a broad representation of folks throughout the city government and also um, the schools. So on the team is Wyatt Shields, our city manager. Uh, we also have Ross Lichtenhouse from the City Council and Shauna Russell from the school board is on there, uh, as well as myself and uh, uh, the principal of the high school. Obviously, Matt Hills is on there. And then we also have our chief operating officer, Kristen Michael, who's here, and our chief academic officer, Lisa High, is on that committee. And Tim Stevens, who's representing the ESC, um, and also the planning commission is on that team. And so we're very excited to start digging into those three final RFDPs um, so to take a look at and, and then down select from there. Um, on the 11th, we will have our meeting where we'll come together and we will, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna hand out the RFPs on the 22nd to the team and then on the 11th, we'll come back together and we will have a pretty significant conversation about where are we, what do we see in these uh, responses and proposals, what do we like, what we don't like, and then we will um, select either one finalist or potentially two. The idea on that June 11th date is to try to get it down to at least one or two of the three. Um, from there, we will move on to uh, an interview process with the two finalists, uh, and we will do that on June 29th. And once that process is complete, we anticipate that we will have one finalist that after June 29th, we will begin negotiating um, a contract with for the design and build process of the new high school. Um, so we are, we're very excited to kind of be in this place. Um, within the next seven days, seven school days, um, we will put up on the website the redacted versions of the proposals that the designers gave us. Um, we asked them this time, as opposed to in the conceptual phase, for a completed copy of a redacted version. So we're gonna scan those and put those up so as you are um, doing your homework and looking at what's out there, I would invite you to go to our web, our web page, um, the Falls Church City Public Schools webpage, and on the right-hand side it says high school construction, and everything is there from these, the, the streaming of these meetings, the recordings of these meetings, all of the information that we've shared up to, to that point, and then the three finalist redacted versions will be there as well. 
So again, sort of in our timeline, um, we are, we've gone through qualifications. We've gotten some design input over the last 10 years, but specifically spent um, a couple of meetings prior to the conceptual phase and design phase going out. Um, we've moved now into um, the designing process. Um, and so what happens with us now is once we go to that final selection and we've negotiated that deal with the design build company, we anticipate um, developing a number of community committees. And these community committees will be based around sort of major themes of the schools, right? So it'll be, um, for example, athletics and activities, curriculum and instruction, community outreach and community, um, uh, community use, um, safety and security. Um, we'll have some that are around transportation. So, as the, those committees are developed, we invite you to go again to the Falls Church City Public Schools site where there is a place, if you're interested, to begin signing up for one of those committees. Mary Beth um, Connolly has put those out there. And again, we'll send something out to the broader community to say, are you interested in participating in one of these committees? And if you are, please sign up here. So what will happen is once the design build company has been finally identified and we've gone through the process, from the probably mid-July until almost May of next year, we will do quite a bit of communications um, around the design of the building with and among the community to identify what do we like, what don't we like, and how can we improve upon what we have. Um, and we'll talk more about that as, as the time goes by. Um, we are very fortunate in this project um, to uh, really sort of introduce and celebrate our new partner um, that we have to help us navigate a lot of this process over the next several years. And our new partner is Brailsford and Dunlavey. Um, some of you may be familiar with Brailsford and Dunlavey. They've done a lot of work in this region um, around, with school construction. Um, and as a consequence of that, we've asked them to come in and partner with us and be our owner's representative. So the analogy, um, for those of you that may not know exactly what an owner's rep does, is we have um, had at the, Mount, the current Mount Daniel project when we opened Mary Ellen Henderson, when we've done uh, the first renovation at, at Mount Daniel, and we also did the addition at Thomas Jefferson, um, we had uh, Bob Jones from Arcadis was our representative for, all, our owner's representative for all of those projects. Um, Bob has been a great asset to the school community. Uh, and, and, and in this process, because of the size and scope of this building, we felt like we needed to go back out to the market to see who was there, um, to see who could help us with the most experience. And Brailsford and Dunleavy was the crew that came through uh, with the most experience and with a true team of people to help us do this work. So um, what, I've, what I've done is um, I put some work uh, that they've done up here, but who better to explain what Brailsford and Dunleavy is than someone from Brailsford and Dunleavy. So uh, I'd like to invite Jeff Bonvecchio um, to come up and talk a little bit about what they do at Brailsford and Dunleavy and also share um, his thoughts about the project. So, Jeff? Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Noonan said, uh, Jeff Bonvecchio from... Oh, okay. Can you guys still hear me? All right. Perfect. Uh, Jeff Bonvecchio from Brailsford and Dunleavy. I serve as a regional vice president for the firm. For this project, I will be serving in the, the role of project executive uh, essentially overseeing that team that, that Dr. Noonan mentioned that we're putting together for uh, overseeing the George Mason High School project. Uh, a little bit about Brailsford and Dunleavy. We've been in business for 25 years based in the, in the D.C. area. Uh, and as you can see, we're just highlighting a few of the, uh, uh, of the work we do and really a, a strong focus on K-12, but also clients that are, are mission-driven. We do not work for for private entities or developers, we work for school districts, for municipalities, for, for colleges and universities. So we are a, a mission-driven uh, firm that, is, that, that works and helps advance these, uh, these projects along. Um, what's highlighted up here on the screen are the projects we've, we've worked on. And what's really important to highlight is that we've worked with all three, if not three teams and the, the six or seven designers and contractors that are associated with these projects. So we're familiar with, with how they work. We're familiar with the tricks they're going to try to play, the, uh, you know, and really, you know, one of our roles, aside from being a, a strategic partner for the school district, is to make that design build team also a partner. We do not want a, a, an adversarial relationship. One of our roles will be to try to, to, to make that a unified team 
uh, with whoever is down selected or finally selected, I should say, uh, over the next month that we're uh, that we're part of this process. Um, and this is our this is our team. As I said, myself, I serve as the project executive. Uh, we do have a, a series of senior advisors uh, that um, have even more experience than than myself that we can call on to uh, you know work directly with uh, with the school with Dr. Noonan and also to advise our team. Uh, you know my background at speaking to myself and trying not to brag I've got close to 20 years experience in the design and construction industry the past 14 years of my career I spent with the DC government uh, doing school projects for the DC public school system as well as I renovated 17 of the district's 25 neighborhood libraries so I I'm I'm passionate about this work I you know came to Brailsford and Dunleavy in order to do what I did in DC and in other parts of the mid-atlantic region and you know having falls church be right in our backyard was a perfect uh, a perfect fit uh, our team is is also made up of the of the firm hanscomb consulting uh, hanscomb is a, a a true what i would call boots on the ground construction management firm they are going to provide the the design management expertise and the construction management expertise and that will be coming from from Brittany and and a new we have a, a cost estimator on our team that we're able to call on uh, currently we're working on a an overall budget analysis of the of the 120 million dollar project but he will also be able to uh, when we pick up our our copies of the rfp or the proposals that came in he will start doing his own detailed analysis of the cost estimates those three firms provided so we'll be able to to have a true back uh, a back check or a analysis of all of their of their pricing um, and as we've heard about the, uh, the community relations uh, and uh, the community engagement piece of this, uh, we do have two individuals uh, on our team that are going to assist the uh, Falls Church City Public Schools with this community engagement process, whether it's in a setting like this or through web updates or Twitter updates. Um, you know, we've got individuals that are committed to make sure that information is being shared um, you know, at the right time, the right type of information in a way that everyone can understand. We don't want to put up on the web page a very complex, detailed construction schedule that, you know, very few people are going to know what the, that means. We want to be able to translate that into to layman's terms so you know what what's going to happen when. And it's also a way to hold the entire team accountable that if we say we're going to start pouring concrete in, you know, July of 2019, you know, we, you know, that we're, we're putting it out there because we want to make that commitment. We've, you know, we've set that expectation and we're going to meet those, those sort of expectations. Um, now you may not see myself every Sunday here, um, but I do, uh, Daisy Brangman, who's our, our senior PM will be the day to day, uh, you know, point of contact. So you will see here next month, um, as part of this process. But again, this is the, uh, the Brailsford and Dunleavy and Hanscomb team We're thrilled to be part of this process and look forward to working with with everyone um, to you know to really make sure that this once in a generational project is complete you know one on time on budget and to the expectations of the of the entire community thank you jeff we appreciate you being here um we've we've uh, to brailsford and dunleavy has really jumped in with both feet already um, from a variety of different perspectives. Um, the, the couple of people that are up here, Daisy Brangman, um, has had a number of meetings with our staff already um, and are really, is, is really trying to dig in and understand fully what the project is. Uh, Beth Penfield, who is uh, one of the school program pers personnel on the Brailsford and Dunleavy team, has met with the school folks already and gone through the whole um, program at the high school. Uh, we've had uh, Brittany and Anu have come by and talked to us about a number of things as well. So when I, when I say they really come as a team, truly they come as a team. And I think that that was one of the things that was most exciting about, me, about them was that there wasn't a single point person, but there was this broad um, team of folks that really come well prepared for their work. They've also were part sponsors of our gala recently, and we thank them for that as well, uh, for jumping in and, and partnering with our, our school foundation. What's that? After we were Way after they were, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was funny, we, we finished contract, well, I, I guess I shouldn't tell, well, I guess I can. We finished contract negotiations and we walked them out and we said, here's Cecily Shea and here's Debbie Hiscott. You need to talk to them. And it was a, a good walkout. Yeah, right, right. So anyway, thank you for being here, Jeff. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. How is an organization like this paid? Hourly, is it a fixed amount? Is it a 
fixed price or yes. is it a percentage of the total yeah. Yeah. contract? Yeah, good question. So um, the way that we... Sure. The, record, the question was, how is a firm like this paid? Is it hourly? Is it as a project? Um, or is it different than that? And so the way that we negotiated our contract with Brailsford and Dunleavy was uh, we started out looking at the hourly rate, and then we ended up looking at it as a, as a full project. So we have a one-time fixed cost for all of the work they're they're, that they are going to do. Um, and that fixed cost then will be paid for out of the bond. And typically, um, the design build process, uh, team process, accounts for a certain percentage of the project, and um, we've met that percentage. And so we're feel, we feel pretty good about that. So is that a public <coughs> or is that uh, still confidential? No, I think the contract is, is public. I, I, um, I'm not exactly sure what the final details were. Um, so let me, let me see if we can't get some information out about that, if that'd be helpful. Hi, Paul. Hi. Uh, what role will the um, um, contract management play in the down selecting process? Great question. So uh, Brailsford and Dunleavy has been very helpful um, in developing criteria based on what we are asking for as a community and what we've asked for in our ed specifications. And they are helping us develop sort of a rubric, if you will, um, to help us score and look at those down selects in a very objective sort of manner so that we can see, okay, does it meet, first of all, our educational requirements? Does it meet all of the things that we've asked for as well? Uh, and the like, and so there's that check, and then they will help us sort of navigate and facilitate, if you will, sort of those conversations. They are not a voting member. Um, they are simply there to help us navigate uh, and ask us, I think, critical questions uh, in the process. Are you thinking about this? Have you thought about this? Here's a real positive here. Not sure how this plays in what you're trying to accomplish. So. They become a partner, but not a voting member. All right, so again, Brailsford and Dunleavy, we are really glad you're here. So the last thing I wanted to share, um, now that I've sort of given you the timeline and the like, is uh, we did do some visitations uh, last, fr not this Friday, but Friday before, uh, to three sites in Virginia that were designed and built by the three down selected companies. And we really felt like it was important for us to go out and see what the final product from some of these companies look like because we anticipate, as I've said here before, that what we're going to build is not your father's or mother's or grandparents' high school. It's gonna look very different. So, I, um, so, so with that in mind, I did bring some pictures and I sort of um, <coughs> cautiously um, say to you, I remember going to my grandparents' house on Thanksgiving when I was a little kid and my grandfather bringing out the carousels of slides and having us all sit on the couch and clicking through these carousels. You remember? Ch chink, ch chink, ch chink. So I've got something like that for you today, um, but I, I will try very hard not to, not to bore you with the gory details. But I do want to say, um, as you're looking at these, um, I talk, a, I, one time, I'll just share with you a very quick story. One time I was um, with my daughter and we were, observing um, Fashion Week. And some of you may have seen Fashion Week. It's like there's one in France, Paris, France, and there's one in New York. And during Fashion Week, um, people come out and they wear these extremely, as I, I would consider, avant-garde sort of outfits, right? And so I looked at my daughter and I said, do people really wear those outfits? And she said, no, nobody really wears those outfits. The designers look at those outfits, get ideas, and then make new ideas from that. And so I share that with you because some of the things you're going to see might work in the City of Falls Church and might not. There's no one very particular fit that is exactly going to work for us, but hopefully you'll see some things in these, um, in these pictures that are just sort of different and um, something to think about as we move forward. Um, and the other thing was, I really felt like it was important for our team to go out so that not only could they see what they might be um, reading in the RFP, but almost to sort of interrupt your thinking a little bit. And when I say that, what I mean is that when I ask you to picture a school in your head, I think a lot of us might think about sort of a traditional facade of a school with a lot of cinder block walls and doors that have a really small narrow window in it that you, know, you go in and then there's classrooms that have rows. And that's not the high school we're building. That's not the high school of the future. And so I, I asked them to come with us to look at some of these schools so we could get some different ideas. So this is our team. Um, little selfie there, sorry about that. 
I thought it was important. And this was our ride. We, we took the little van around. And this is the first school we saw. <clears throat> and this is um, Frederick County, and it was a middle school. And this, this school was designed by Stantec. Um, there's a couple of things that I want you to observe when you look at these pictures. And I'll go through them relatively quickly, because I think it's important to give Wyatt some time, too, just a little bit anyway. Um, some things that you, I, I hope you'll observe are, what are some of the materials that you're seeing? What does the landscape look like? What are some of the safety and security measures that are in place? What do the classrooms look like? What, do, what does the furniture look like? Um, are the kid, do the kids appear to be happy? There was one school that we went to where there weren't kids in, so can't really share that with you. But um, this one was the first one that we saw. And, and I would say, as you're looking at this, the first thing I hope that you'll notice, and it's a little hard to see, is that there's a lot of glass, right? There's a lot of daylighting in this building. Um, and it's something that they're very proud of. And then there are, there's brick block in the front. And then there's also some wood in that front facade as well. This is a little bit closer up um, to see. And I'll post all these online so you can kind of look at them. Is it all right if I sit down? And I'll just do it that way. OK. So, <clears throat> so here you see the front again. Then you go in the building. And this is from the inside looking out. So the first thing I hope you'll notice there is, again, there's a lot of glass. But there is um, two, this is like a, a cube that you can't get through. So it's a vestibule that is secure. So the first thing that happens is you come through that vestibule, and you can't go straight into the building. You have to go into the office to check in first. And there are a, a multiple security measures that you have to go through uh, to do that. Here you'll see um, some of the materials are um, a type of, of uh, cinder block here, or a type of block. This is a wood facade that's here. Just kind of gives it some unique architectural features that we're looking at. Um, this, is, um, this is somebody that's talking to us. But the idea here is that this building, uh, or this room, is directly adjacent to that front hallway you go into. And it looks out onto the front of the building. So let's see. There you go. So that gives you a sense of what it looks like. This is the work room, um, the, or the, the classroom that's associated with the media center or the library. And I, I think that it's a, it's a, a cool multi-purpose room. The furniture that, that was in there can be mixed and matched in a variety of different ways. Um, but again, I think the most important thing to sort of note in this picture is the amount of daylighting that happens in this building. Um, and this is the front hallway. So when you walk through those double doors, I had my, my back to this area as I was looking out front. If I were to turn around, this is what I would see. <clears throat> this is the spine of the building, sort of from front to back. And when you turn around, this is the library. It's, it's the library, right? So if you think about what is a library to you, this is not what many people think of when they think of a library. This, to me, looks like a kiosk in a mall, right? So you're walking down the mall, and, and there in the middle of it is this, this library. They have great circulation. They have kids that are working there all the time. Um, it's a little bit noisy, but that's what I think media centers and libraries today should be, a little bit noisy. Um, and there are a couple of things that architecturally really work here, right? So there, you can walk around the outside of the library, so there's good flow. And in the back here is a, a monumental staircase, and that monumental staircase goes to the second floor. On the left-hand side of that monumental staircase, it's like every other step, and it's a wooden sort of seating amphitheater, if you will. And to the right are steps that go up to that second floor. You see the high ceiling that goes all the way to the roof deck and a dropped ceiling here that's kind of wood with some lights that drop down. So I, I share that with you because that the, that's the first thing that sort of is shocking when you walk in this building is that the media center is right in the middle. Uh, it's the heart of the school, if you will. It's right in the middle. And, and in many ways, it speaks to, I think, the values of our community, particularly around the International Baccalaureate Program and inquiry. Inquiry is what we're all about. What are the questions we're asking? How do we, how do we look at ideas and learn from them? This is an area just off to the right um, over in this area. And I'm looking down to a hallway. So again, a lot of glass, a lot of sight lines, a lot of visibility to kind of see different things that you're looking at. This is sort of standing in front of the media center looking back. This is that classroom space that can be used, or multi-purpose space that can be used for a variety of different purposes. The other thing you'll see here is this flooring, um, just in terms of finishes and materials that are interesting. This is polished concrete. And polished concrete is a very popular 
um, mode of, of finish now in many schools. So it's not sort of that VCT vinyl tile that you see. Um, it's not terrazzo either, which is really beautiful, um, but it, which is very expensive, but it does polish up very nicely. Um, here you'll see there are a number of spaces that are breakout rooms like this off the media center and in different hallways that are called collaboration spaces. So it's places that kids can go in teams and work. Again, um, note, note that the walls to that collaboration space are all glass. Um, and, and so the sight lines, again, are really good. So you can, in a, if you're in the media center and you say to some students, I want you to go collaborate around this idea or this project, go over there, they can go in that classroom and they can observe them in that classroom and in that space. <clears throat> this is one of the pods. So, so if you think about the spine of the school, if you were looking to the right, this is one of the, one of the pods that goes off to the right. And here, in these low walls, are the locker banks. So the lockers are just really low. They're two up and down, up and down, um, small. One here, one here, one here, one here, and across. And there are four that go back. Again, great sight lines. It also gives another space for students to work. They can stand at those spots and they can work collaboratively. And then you walk back either this way or this way, and you get into the classroom spaces. And when you get back here, here's what you see. This is a classroom, right? All glass walls. Um, and this space out here is sort of in the middle, and it's a collaborative space. One of the things we asked, because we were quite worried, was, you know, what is it, what is it like in terms of interruptions to classes when there's glass? And they said for the first week, there was a lot of, there was a lot of kids turning around, checking out what was going on. And now it's completely normalized, and the kids don't even pay attention. We were there taking pictures, and the kids were working away in those classes. Here again is a, another class looking in. Again, a really great sight line. As a school administrator, I love being able to walk by a classroom and see what's happening. And I can see from the middle of the hallway six different classrooms and what's happening in those classrooms. Again, take a look at the furniture. Um, that's not a regular chair. Some of you have probably seen these chairs. That's like a wobbly chair. So kids can sit on it and kind of move around. Um, we have a lot of kids that can use that. And adults. Um, this is the collaborative space outside of the six classrooms. It's the collaborative pod. Again, some very um, casual seating for some kids to come and kind of work in. Um, here you'll see some of the classrooms and teacher spaces. Here are some kids coming out to do some work. Um, again, using that glass for different purposes. They were using it to solve prompt mathematical equations. They were writing on it. They kept agendas on it. Lots of different ways to use the space. This is a, a kind of a collab another collaborative space that's part of the pod. Each of these pods has a little wet area. Um, and then here's a couple more classrooms. That's the, uh, the collaborative breakout space. So you'll see two classrooms, one here, one here, and then there's one over here and one over here. Um, and these kids come out and they're working um, all the time in this open space. This is the media center from an aerial view. And then here's a sort of a look into the gym. You'll see over here is the gym through those doors. So if you think about the spine going back, all the classrooms are on the right, all the public spaces are on the left. So we've got the, media, uh, uh, the gym and the uh, cafeteria on the left. And there's that grand sort of staircase there, a little bit more. Um, this is a, another sort of typical classroom. Again, this is a little science lab. You'll see, uh, you won't see any desks in this building. They're all tables um, that are on wheels, and all the chairs are on wheels too, so that we can maneuver and negotiate space for different purposes. This is a teacher workstation or work area. This is an end unit where kids just kind of hang out and can do some work. Um, these are, I just put this in here because I thought it was interesting. If you look up, um, we've got open, open to the deck ceiling, um, and then some low, and this is wood, these are wood, sort of uh, acoustical pieces to keep some of the sound down. This is looking from the second floor back. So I'm standing, um, let, me, let me just say it this way. This is the front of the building. I'm sorry, that's not the front of the building. This is the cafeteria back here. So when the kids get their food in the cafeteria, they can stay in the cafeteria or they can flow out here and they can eat their lunches out this direction. It's also, again, a nice collaborative space. Here's the gym. In this building, one of the ed specs was they called for a, a, a fitness center, and there's a fitness center. Uh, there's also um, a yoga mat or yoga room, 
And these folks are walking around an indoor track. Um, and we also have an R ed spec and indoor track as well. So kids can run around that indoor track. Here's looking down from the top of that monumental staircase that I talked about, looking forward to the front of the building. And this is used all the time. Teachers are teaching in this space uh, and the like. And here, looking in the cafeteria. This is kind of a grab and go situation. So it's much more like, you know, you've got a couple of different places you can go and grab your stuff. So the lines are different. They have a cafetorium. We're not going to have a cafetorium, but again, not one size fits all. And here are some more of the breakouts. This is, a, this is an interesting space. This is kind of like their maker space here in the front. And in the back is where um, all the tools and, and materials are. So when they're making things, they're doing it back there. What's kind of cool is we're in the hallway. And so we can see all the way through back to where they're working with some of the materials and working with other things. So again, the sight lines into classrooms are really, really quite fascinating. And this is just kind of an open space in between floors that are used for a variety of purposes. So that's the first place. Oh, there's the monumental staircase again. All right. This is the second school we went to. This is Colgan High School in Prince William County. Um, they serve about 2,200 students in this building. <clears throat> again, one of the things you'll see in this facade is a lot of glass. They have some architectural features here that are kind of rounded. Um, the idea here was to kind of look at a more domed uh, approach. There's sort of two spines that go from front to back. One goes cafeteria gym, and the other one goes cafeteria to the auditorium. And then from left to right are the classroom spaces. And then on one end is a, a swimming pool. So try not to pay too much attention to the swimming pool. Um, <coughs> again, this is a, an interior vestibule with security person here. Um, all of this glass is ballistic glass. Um, so, it's, uh, so, so that's there as well. Here you can't get through left or right. The only way in is to go forward. Um, once you get in, you look up, and you can kind of see some of those architectural dome features that are there. Um, there is a, this is a um, sort of an overlook where students can overlook the front of the building. Um, this is looking from inside out. Again, a lot of daylighting in this building. And here's the vestibule that we're in. So when you walk in, immediately you kind of go into a cafeteria. Um, this cafeteria is um, kind of a grab and go as well. It's all on the right hand side, um, but it's a little more contained. So students stay in the cafeteria. It doesn't tend to flow out into other areas like other places, the, the couple other places we saw. This is the gym. This is a huge field house. There are three full size basketball courts. Um, I share it with you just to kind of give you a sense of what the roof line looks like. It's an open, open to the deck kind of roof. Um, but again, it can be split into multiple teaching spaces. So these screens come down, and you can break it off into different places. One of the things we're looking at in our building as part of the ed spec is our large gym being able to divide into four spaces. There's a weight room. Um, there was a great picture. I took it out of Matt Hills kind of staring at the weights. And I thought, there's got to be a joke in there somewhere, but I <laughs> preferred not to. Uh, here's their swimming pool. <clears throat> this is the swimming pool that's used by all Prince William County schools for all of their events. So they are the one school in the whole county that has a pool. They also have um, a public space. This is available to the public during the day. Um, so it's actually operated by the schools, but they work in conjunction with the Prince William County Parks and Rec Department. So you see this is, uh, they have youth programs that go there as well. Swim and dive. This is the other cafeteria. Again, kind of going through this one you get to the, to the um, auditorium. This is the Fine and Performing Arts High School in Prince William County. So when I show you the auditorium, you're going to be blown away just by the sheer volume of, of seats that are there. Um, but this, again, is where all of the big, pro, uh, big shows that happen in Prince William County happen. Um, this is an outdoor amphitheater. I thought this was kind of a cool, um, a cool feature in this school, so they can do some outdoor theater. There's, there's seating here that's kind of tiered coming back this way. Um, but it's covered for, for rain. Some of the landscaping is, uh, it's all sustainable landscaping that they have in there. Um, and here's the theater. Again, you'll see the acoustical tiles up here, um, brick all the way through. It seats 1,500. Um, so it gives you just a sense of uh, scope and grandeur of this particular um, building. Um, it has a convertible, uh, well, anyway, it's got, a, got a really cool features. These are some of the practice rooms for the band. Uh, here's the music program. It's a single floor. It's not a tiered band program. We've gone away from those tiered programs. Um, better to have them on flat 
Um, this is their media center. We couldn't go in because it was an SOL day. Um, but here you'll see again that sort of domed architectural feature there. Um, I, I will say it could have been library anywhere to me, um, not to interject too much of my own um, sense, but it did kind of look so, sort of traditional. Um, this is a long hallway, uh, just to give you a sense of what the corridors look like that you go into. And then this is, a, again, kind of looking out and looking into the community spaces. This is a teacher um, in a teacher workroom who's completely surprised that I took her picture. Again, some more daylighting features that they have, some high, high areas of light. Again, you'll see the lockers down here that run along the side of the building, or side of the walls. And this is a sort of a fairly traditional corridor for classrooms. This is a blurry classroom space. Um, another teacher workroom. And then this is their courtyard. And this does give sort of a public space to kind of flow out into throughout the, throughout the day. <clears throat> this is a unique feature of this building as well. There's a greenhouse, and we're standing in the greenhouse, and it overlooks uh, that. That's what we're looking at, looking outside. Um, so when I think about Richard uh, Kane's farm bot and some of those kinds of things, I think about um, this being a potential space for that. So that's Colgan High School. Uh, and then the last spot we saw was Dunbar High School in the district. And this, this um, let me go back, Mosley and Clark were the architects and firm that did um, Colgan High School, and then Perkins Eastman is the team that did Dunbar. So this is the third of the teams that we've seen. Again, sort of looking at Dunbar from the outside, some of the things you'll note right away are the mixes of material. Um, you'll see brick, you'll see concrete, you'll see metal. Uh, and, the, and a lot of glass again, a lot of daylighting. You go in, that's terrazzo tile. That's very expensive poured, um, poured um, material. But again, you're in the vestibule here for security. Um, can't get through uh, without going through that vestibule. And then when you do get in, there's a grand staircase that kind of goes, it opens up into a large, um, uh, audit, not an auditorium, but a large area that goes up uh, to the second floor. Um, this is kind of looking, so if you go into the building and look left, you will see some large windows all the way at the end that overlooks the football stadium. And then if you look right, then you would see this is the cafeteria. The cafeteria is kind of wide open. Kids can grab and go and get their food. And then this is looking from front to back out towards the street. So it gives you a sense of the scope and grandeur of, of the school. <coughs> This is their uh, swimming pool that they've been able to do in their building. And here is their auditorium. Their auditorium seats uh, 650 students, which is about the size of the auditorium we're looking at. Um, it's beautiful, uh, first of all. And they have two, it's two levels, so um, orchestra and then a balcony area. So this is looking at it from back, front to back. What's interesting in here is the acoustics um, that Lindy's up here talking about, and you'll see um, here and the roof and on the walls are a wood material. It's acoustical wood um, and it's really this dark, um, lovely wood. This is the back of the stage. So if you were sitting in a seat and looked back, you would be able to see out the building. Um, and how they work this during plays and shows is they have a black screen or a black drape that they pull that's completely um, uh, light proof that closes it off. So then, then you have uh, then, you, then you're able to do your theater that way. This is the wood. I just took a close-up of it. Here's their gym, um, a competition-sized gym um, that you could pull some bleachers out for. Uh, again, it overlooks uh, the football field. Um, and it's on the second, second floor, just by the way. Give you a sense of that. And there, there you go. You can see out uh, onto the football field. But it's a really tight space. It's on eight acres. So it's a, a school that's built on eight acres. And then we go into the media center. Um, but before we go into the media center, if you turned your body to your right, you would see this space. This is kind of an open space now. It's meant to be kind of a gathering space for students eventually. But right now, um, they haven't outfitted it with any, um, any seats or any seating or anything like that. Then you get into the uh, media center, soft, casual seating for students, high ceilings, again, the wood. Um, these postage stamps are famous alums from Dunbar um, that they are highlighting. Uh, and again, that same wood that you see here kind of carries through the building. So you see it not only in the library, but you see it in the auditorium and throughout the school. 
And then we get into um, the classroom spaces. And this is the end. So if I walked into a doorway and looked right, I would see a long hallway. On the left-hand side would be classroom, traditional classrooms. On the right-hand side would be labs. And directly behind me would be the administrative offices. And what you're looking at is the administrative offices. So then you look down, and on the right are the labs, and on the left are the classrooms. These are lab spaces. Um, again, low light, lots of daylighting, lots of glass. This is a traditional um, space for classroom. Again, uh, kind of low lighting, lots of glass. This is a net zero um, building. Um, Colgan was not net zero um, or, or lead. This is a lead gold, or is it gold, Jeff, or is it platinum? Platinum, lead platinum with net zero. Um, the first school that I shared with you was net zero water and also lead gold. Um, so these are the traditional sort of classroom spaces that you see. Those are the photovoltaics on the roof, one of the sets of photovoltaics on the roof. And then um, as you look out the building, you'll see this is sort of the promenade to the football field. And you come through, and then um, the football field is there. So that was our trip. I will stop there because I've used up way too much time. Um, but I wanted to share this with you because I thought it was important to kind of get a sense for what buildings can look like as opposed to what our buildings currently look like. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Wyatt Shields. And again, I'll post these online so you can see them. Well, thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, so uh, thank you for those. That, I think those slides were very interesting. Um, Maybe before yeah, we want, go, do you want to get oh, questions happy first? Happy to take some questions about what we saw. if we do questions, give me time to bring the microphone so it gets <coughs> recorded because we're filming. Who had a question? Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I came a little late, but did you say that these were uh, people who have bid samples yes. of their work? Okay. These are samples of the three finalists. The so the first finalists. one okay. was um, Stantec was the architect. The second one, okay. Mosley was the architect, and the last one, um, Perkins Eastman was the architect. Okay. So my other question is uh, for the auditorium that seated 1,500, mm -hmm. do they use it for more than the schools? Do they have it filled like every weekend? No, they, they do not. Um, in fact, it's underutilized according to some of the folks that were there. They do use it for their big things throughout the county, but for their school purposes only, it's highly underutilized. Peter? Yes, sir. Um, so of this, the six teams, it's obvious that five squares is one. That's, that's with Mosley. Oh, that, you know, that's the, um, oh. I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt, I'm sorry. No, please. That is the 10-acre uh, site. Um, so, oh, so that's thank not the you. school site. So I'll be discussing that you. part thank of you. it. Thank in, you, in that was my, confusing. my part, just a moment. Uh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of procurement happening. <coughs> OK. I had. I had the privilege of uh, visiting Dunbar one time also, and the the materials are indestructible. And the one thing you didn't do, and I did, I had to go in and see the bathrooms. <laughs> and the materials. I didn't put the bathrooms in there, but I did go see I them. mean, the materials in those bathrooms were, you couldn't, other than spray paint. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just uh, fantastic. But there are a lot of, you know, um, a lot of storm water and a lot of uh, I, is Dunbar geothermal. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. And right, right, water. and then the the pools or the holding places out to the side were very, very interesting, and it was just a fascinating. Uh, it's a beautiful building. It's very separated for uh, public use and versus school use, which is a really good idea because they even have a clinic down there, a neighborhood clinic, which is fantastic. But uh, it's it's quite a quite a place. All, all three of them were very beautiful in their unique ways, um, and I, I think what we saw as a team was um, some advantages to all of them and some disadvantages to to all of them as well. But I I think. Your point about the indestructibility is one that we want to pay close attention to because we don't want to um, build something that's going to fall apart in 20 years. Yeah. Oh, question there. I'm sorry if I came in. I came in a little late, but okay. I was curious about. Um, I saw in several or in the three schools you showed the the entrance vestibule where the security was, but 
given all the recent events too, I was just curious what other security measures were taken into place because I love all the glass, but when I saw that, my heart's kind of skipped a beat. Actually, um, what we were- I don't know we if like th what, things come down. Yeah, so there were a couple of other security features in all the buildings that I think are really important um, w that, that I didn't mention, and one is that there are remote ways to cordon off uh, areas of the building, so all of the doors are magnetized to those pods. So in that first one, for example, when you looked at the pod, there were double doors that came open. Remotely, those doors can close and are, uh, are locked, and nobody can get in. Um, that can happen throughout the building. There's um, also ballistic glass in a number of the places. Um, but what we heard from all of the folks at Dunbar and at um, Frederick County was that they felt safer in the glass classrooms than they did in concrete classrooms, um, particularly when it came to safety and security issues because they could, they could then make good decisions about whether to stay or go. Um, and there's also uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of ways that video can capture um, those areas and video will be part of our solution as well. I didn't see that in all of the schools, but it will be part of our safety and security solution. So when we um, look at those live video streams that are coming in, we can also turn those over to the police immediately and they can close those doors and then we can make decisions about what we're gonna do with those kids that are there. So, um, so that was, that was um, and some other, other things that were there. Well, I will be around after and would love to talk about the visits um, a little more if you'd like. So now I'll turn it over to Okay, well thank you, Dr. Nin. And so traditionally how we do this is both of us provide a little bit of information out and then answer questions or hear comments or concerns that you might have. Um, what I'll be talking about is the financing of, of the school project and the economic development piece of it, which is part and parcel of the financing of the high school. And for those, we, we raised hands at the beginning of this meeting, of, for those who have been part of these Sunday series meetings from the beginning, but I do see some new faces, so I'll just hit a couple of the basic ideas of our planning that just about everybody's familiar with, but I want to take it for granted. But this is the overview of uh, our George Mason High School campus. And the basic idea is as we build a brand new high school, and it'll likely be uh, in this area of the campus, that we can tap the value of this property, which because of its location right with access right to I-66 and West Falls Church value, uh, uh, Metro is highly valuable real estate. Um, in terms of the cost of the project, and, and when you look at these really state-of-the-art and beautiful schools that Dr. Noonan was reviewing, uh, the feasibility study that was done last year uh, came to an estimated construction cost of 117 million uh, with financing costs a total of 120 million which was approved by the voters last November. In uh, just a few days on May 23rd we'll be selling the first tranche of bonds of 6.5 million <coughs> which will pay for the architecture and engineering for the project and then a lot of the process that I'll be describing very briefly is to get us ready financially for the big debt issuances uh, for construction about this time next year. We're planning to finance the school with with 30-year bonds. So conceptually, and this is the feasibility study that was done last year, uh, the new high school construction is going to be in this location, um, a buffer zone, uh, potentially the, the practice field that is here would be moved to the front as, as a buffer to the economic development and, and a nice interface with the economic development. Um, but what I'll be talking about is the process for taking this approximately 10 acres uh, to market. Um, we have a schedule here which, which lays out um, sort of the, the schedule for the high school project, which Peter has described, and uh, this column are the key steps on the economic development side. Uh, the city issued its request for conceptual proposals in March, uh, just several months ago, and uh, we received six proposals, and those are the proposals that you were referring to, sir, and the list of the, of the proposers <coughs> is uh, on the table in the back. Um, our uh, intention is that we'll issue a request for detailed proposals in June. Um, those will be due in August, and then by the fall, uh, is when the city would select its top-ranked economic development par partner for the 10 acres site. Um, and then we have, until this time next year, really 12 months from now, um, 
after we've selected our top development uh, partner to go through a land use approval process, which will be very public, um, uh, and our normal process with the planning commission of all of our boards and commissions to review the conceptual development plan, approve the zoning for it, and also uh, finalize the transaction terms for the land lease or sale of the 10 acres. The city's preference is for a long-term land lease. Um, then in, in uh, June of 2019 is when we'd issue the debt for the high school. Construction would begin immediately thereafter. In the two years that it takes for the high school to be built, the economic development piece will go through its final site plan, get its building permits, and is anticipated, anticipated that it would break ground then in 2021 after we've moved into the new high school and then the old high school can be demolished. So that's the overall schedule that, uh, that we're working through. Um, so really what this is, every step of the way is a very coordinated process between the school administration and the school board and the general government administration and the city council and all of the boards and commissions that inform uh, uh, the city council and, and its key decisions. So we get together at least once a month. Right now it's on a monthly basis. That may accelerate as we get into uh, more decisions. Uh, but to uh, ensure that the design, scheduling, financial decisions for both the school and the economic development are coordinated. Um, so our process, as, as I noted, we've received six proposals. They're really outstanding firms that have uh, put in proposals for the 10 acres of development. What this first step in our procurement is really just a, it's, it's the equivalent of a request for qualifications. We'll be evaluating these firms on their financial capacity, on their experience in doing major mixed-use projects, and the quality and the feel of those projects. I think we'll go eventually on a tour as well uh, before we make a final decision later this summer after the detailed phase uh, for, the, for, the, uh, <coughs> for the economic development uh, uh, partners that we'll be looking at. The proposals are posted on the city webpage, and very little of it is confidential. They're redacted as well, but the proposals, uh, by far, uh, you know, by far and away, most of the information that they put in is public. And so, I encourage you to go onto the city webpage and take a look at, at what the market is proposing uh, for the 10-acre site. We'll do an evaluation through the month of May, and uh, bring to the city council recommendations on. Uh, the, the top three uh, of the six uh, proposals for economic development. Now, it may end up being three or four, but I think the goal is to try to narrow it down to three um, uh, potential finalists that would then go into the detailed phase. Uh, this is the uh, selection committee, and I think the main point here is that it is broadly representative of the school board, planning commission, economic development authority, city council, um, uh, with staff, uh, uh, as well, and then a very strong advisory and support team for that selection process. The request for detailed proposals, we have copies of the draft of that uh, on the back table. Um, we're going to be working on finishing that draft through the uh, end of the month of May and into June. And one of the key things we want to do is we want to read through the proposals in great detail, and then some of that information will inform uh, the final words that we put into a request for detailed proposals. But we also want public input in that draft as well. Uh, the City Council has been very clear. They want these documents out, they want people reading them, and they want people to be knowledgeable about what we're putting into the RFDP and uh, want your, your input into it. So the goal is to issue that in June, and then the uh, proposals from the, uh, from the top-ranked respondents would be due in August. I'll give an update because uh, a lot of people helped on this. Uh, we have really significant grants pending with the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. And uh, Council Member uh, Dave Snyder is our representative on that authority. He, he and, and many others have been working um, to help us get some transportation money for the site. Uh, Council Member Letty Hardy also has been uh, spreading the word and, and Vice Mayor Connolly. Uh, so I think we'll hear early next week in terms of what the disposition of the, at least the staff recommendations are for these grants. Uh, but $15.7 million is what we've put for really to relieve congestion at that intersection, improve walkability, improve access to West Falls Church Metro, 
approve walkability to the WNOD. So they're uh, pretty exciting improvements that are embedded in those grants that uh, would be very helpful to us. Um, I'll just give a, a note for the Sunday series. Uh, this is meant to be predictable for people that they, that they uh, know that these meetings are, are on Sundays. They're at 2 o'clock and they're always in this room. Uh, because of a host of scheduling issues, our next one actually is in August, on August 5th. Um, then after that, we'll get onto a more normal uh, monthly schedule with the next one in September 23rd, and then we'll be monthly uh, thereafter, and we need to pick those dates. Um, I'll just give a plug also. On Thursday, uh, May 24th, the Environmental Sustainability Council is uh, having a panel, and, uh, and Corey in the back is the chairman of the Environmental uh, Sustainability Council. Uh, but they've been put together, uh, they've been really advising the city throughout this process on sustainability and resiliency on the campus. And Thursday will be a continuation of that and we'll have a series of experts that will talk about stormwater and energy sustainability on the site. That's at 7.30 on May 24th. Can I, can I invite the uh, community that's going to go to consider an environmentally sustainable option for getting there? Uh, because it's also the same night as our high school award ceremony. So you may find parking to be a, at a premium. So if you can bike or walk or yeah. carpool or That's great. take public yeah. transportation, that'd be great. Right. Um, so uh, if you have comments uh, or if you want to see the information, it's all up on the city webpage and, and we've set these, uh, put these addresses up as well. So, uh, Mr. Schneider. Thanks a lot, uh, Wyatt. Thanks for the presentation and everyone here. Two quick comments. Could you go back to the original calendar uh, list? Because I want to emphasize one key point, and it's an absolutely fundamental point. Yeah. In May of 2019, we need to have a legally enforceable development agreement as a precondition to issuing the bonds That's right. for the construction of the school. So I think it's very important to emphasize the critical importance of moving these two projects along and coordinating the two. The second point I wanted to make is about the transportation element um, that we are working with Fairfax County to make sure that what we do at that critical inter intersection serves the region, Fairfax County, um, as well as the city of Falls Church. So coordination will be very close with Fairfax County and I just wanted to make that point. But thank yeah. you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Snyder. Um, and Fairfax County has passed a resolution in favor of the grant applications as well, and, and, uh, and you did a lot of work to help make that happen. Uh, but that's really important for us uh, in terms of getting resources to help with some of the transportation improvements. So that is the end of uh, the presentation of the slides that I had. So I think now we'll just open it up to questions or comments. And we would ask that you uh, use the microphone and ask that you just introduce yourself by name uh, uh, you know, before you, before you uh, ask your question or make a comment. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Wyatt, John Coleman. Um, my recollection, and this goes back a while, but when we acquired the land that the school is on as part of the water sale, there were some limitations on the density of development that we could do. Um, do the um, proposals that came in and the, uh, the plan for the school, do they fall within those restrictions or are we going to have um, request different uh, exemptions to, uh, uh, to build what we want to do? Um, let me modify it just a little bit because there were actually not restrictions on the density. What there, were, what there was is a, an agreement, a mutual agreement between Fairfax <coughs> County and the City Falls Church that on the campus, 70% of it would be used for educational purposes for 50 years, and the remaining 30% could be used for any lawful use that the city um, sets through its own zoning process. So um, there are no density limits on it. We are planning to, um, the city council has had preliminary discussions, the planning commission has had some initial uh, work and we'll have much more work I think in the coming weeks on the zoning for the site and what we are proposing is a modified B2 zoning which would allow up to 15 stories uh, on the 10 acres of the site. 
Um, and there may be some discussion with the Planning Commission and the City Council whether 15 stories is the right number, but and that will be done in a very public way where the public can weigh in on what is the appropriate density. Um, but we'll use as, you know, the zoning that we're familiar with, uh, which is the B2 zoning, and it will be modified somewhat for the special circumstances of, of the campus. Why could you just confirm for everyone that the school's proposals and those six proposals are compliant with the water sale proceed settlement? Um, well, we'll review all of, yeah, our, our plan from the beginning has been to full, fully comply with that agreement. And, um, and our, I, I would say that our coordination with Fairfax County on this has been high. We've had regular staff meetings. There have been meetings of our elected officials on a pretty regular basis because uh, we want Fairfax County to know every step of the way what it is that we're, you know, every step in our process for them to be well informed about it um, and avoid any kinds of surprises. Uh, Sean Dakin, I, I don't know if this has been covered in other meetings, but I have read about additional development uh, through MARTA or through <laughs> Fairfax County it is happening around the same location. So I wanted to just know what our thoughts are about how that impacts our proposal, if any. Well, thank you for raising it. It's, it's real important to us. So we have um, uh, our neighbors here is the University of Virginia and Virginia Tech. Um, this is about eight acres in total. Um, with a chunk of it actually under a ground lease to the city of Falls Church. Um, <coughs> this piece of, of the uh, college, uh, the universities, is actually owned by, by the universities. And then we have another approximately 14 acres of land owned by WMATA. And so for the past three years, we've been working with them, encouraging them to plan their land and, and their future at the same time that we're doing ours. I think we are, frankly, a little bit ahead of them. Uh, these are big institutions, and uh, their decision-making process um, has been uh, probably a step or two behind ours. But what WMATA, when, they, uh, when, when Metro put forward a comprehensive plan amendment, that is a really just a first step uh, to engage with Fairfax County about the future of their property. And that's going to take probably 18 months to go through the Fairfax County process of their evaluation of that comp plan amendment. But uh, Fairfax County has accepted it as an application to change the comp plan, and so that process will proceed. Um, and UVA and Virginia Tech, um, uh, Virginia Tech in, in particular is going through a, a, a long-range planning process for all of its Northern Virginia properties. There are three campuses in Northern Virginia, and uh, we're uh, and, and a lot of that was really encouraged by us to start thinking about how they want to use this property. Um, so I think there's more to come on that. I don't want to speak for them, but that's the, sort of the state of their planning. And we have felt from the beginning that it's really important that we do the planning work together. In our conceptual plan, um, you know, we have roads that connect through the property. We have, you know, more perviousness uh, to the overall site than exists today. They're on board with that conceptually, and I think in the coming weeks, months, uh, we'll try to get a little bit more firm <coughs> on how those um, uh, networks could work. But that's part of the way to relieve congestion uh, here at this, at this intersection. And improve walkability and just make it a more pleasant place than it is today. Can you say if any of the six submissions uh, more or less emphasize collaboration with WMATA and the universities? Uh, they, is that part of their plans that they've submitted to the city? Well, I will say that my review of the proposals really is just beginning, so I, I can't comment on any of them individually. Um, it is in our RFP, however, that you know, we note the importance of our neighbors. We state that we're going to evaluate what's proposed on our property and rank it based on that, but we would like them to be of a mindset that thinks about how this property will work well with our neighbors. How far off in the future can, is it when UVA and Virginia Tech can exercise their option to purchase that land? 
Um, it's a few years out. I believe 2021 is the uh, beginning of their ability to, op uh, to execute their option to purchase. So when I, I did mention that this property is, uh, exists on a land lease with UVA and Virginia Tech, it is a land lease with an option to purchase. And so um, they have effective control over that property for all intents and purposes. Um, but we are very much a stakeholder and an interested party, and we have tried to use that, um, you know, for the city's long-term interest uh, of what happens on, on the 10 acres as well, and what happens for the, you know, the full, uh, you know, 24 plus acres when it's all added together. It's a beautiful day outside. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will stay if there are any follow-up questions, but um, thank you very much for coming again to our, I guess this is now our fifth Sunday series, and we'll keep them going. Uh, it's, it is, I think, both the school board and the city council, they are absolutely committed. These are really big <coughs> decisions and important uh, steps we're taking in the process, and the commitment is that it's going to be very open and very uh, public uh, every step of the way. And uh, that, that's what these meetings are all about, to try to make sure people are informed and we're getting the questions, comments, and concerns as we go. And I, I just would also like to say thank you for coming and appreciate your time on such a beautiful day. I know we're not meeting again until August, but between now and August, there will be some things that are going to be happening um, with the RFDP for the school site. So I would invite you to, to, do, to uh, do go to our website, um, our construction website, and see what's there. Um, we will be announcing um, things as they happen. Um, to make sure that everybody's in the, in the loop. And John Brett, our, our webmaster extraordinaire, is here today. Uh, and, and if you have any questions about what's on the website, he's the one to ask. So anyway, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, yeah, thank have you a great all. Good afternoon. <laughs>